Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all denarians on the go and in the know, like subscribe, and share to help support the channel. First article of interest for today. Abdel Mahdi and Hal Bousy preside over a joint meeting to discuss economic conditions. A joint meeting chaired by Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi and Speaker of Parliament Mohammed Al Halbousi was held in the government palace today, Thursday, to discuss the financial and economic situation in government spending in light of the decline in global oil prices and the decline in demand for it and the corona pandemic and financial budget entitlements. A statement of the Prime Minister's office, which was received by the Euphrates News Agency, said that the meeting discussed the plans procedures and proposed solutions to confront this crisis that Iraq and all countries of the world are exposed to. He added that the meeting called by Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi was attended by Speaker of Parliament Mohammed al halbousi First Deputy Hassan al kabi Deputy Prime Ministers, Oil and Finance Ministers, Minister of Planning, Heads of Financial economic and energy committees in the House of Representatives and the Governor of the Central Bank and a number of deputy ministers and advisors. Abdul Mahdi and al halbousi presented their vision of economic and social realities and the necessary solutions, foremost of which is the necessity of maximizing state resources, reducing dependence on oil, protecting the weaker social classes, and achieving societal, food, and drug security. The two presidents stressed the cooperation between the executive and legislative branches, and the continuation of meetings and consultations between the specialized committees to reach the best solutions and procedures that meet the needs of citizens and achieve social justice and the supreme interest of the country. The statement pointed out that a detailed explanation was provided by the Minister of Oil on the position of Iraq on the drop in oil prices and the quotas of all producing countries were heard during the recent OPEC meeting. And the Minister of Finance says financial situation, income and expenses and the requirements of the financial budget, as planning minister and the heads of parliamentary committees made a number of proposals and economic processors. Next article of interest. K card. The sobriety of the Central Bank of Iraq made it the most important site for the Arab financial sector. The company, K card, congratulated the governor of the Central Bank of Iraq, Ali Al Alak, on the occasion of his election as chairman of the Board of Governors of the Arab Monetary Fund. The company said in a statement, which has received Al Farid News a copy of it that the Central Bank of Iraq has proven its sobriety in the face of major challenges in recent years, qualifying it to be in the most important sites of the Arab financial sector. She added that the directives of the Central have an active role in spreading the culture of electronic payment in the country and expanding financial inclusion, valuing Ali Al-Alaq's presence in this place and wishing him success and success in his upcoming tasks. Next article of interest. The Secretariat of the Council of Ministers reveals Iraq's external debt. The government is awaiting a response. The General Secretariat of the Council of Ministers revealed the volume of external debts on Iraq. There are overtures between the government and the International Monetary Fund to stop completing the burial of Iraq and awaiting a response, noting that there is no response at the present time, as well as no, said Alaglo Balfad. The official spokesman for the Government Information and Communication Office and the General Secretariat of the Council of Ministers. There are claims for payment. Al Fad said, The government in every year when it has a deficit that the World Bank has approached the lend to in order to finance the budget, and this year there are many things that will be taken into consideration, as the United States has proposed stopping debt repayment at this stage which is good especially the debts of Iraq to be paid to the IMF this year are estimated at more than $10 billion, and if there is an agreement, this will benefit Iraq with the economic and political situation in which it lives at this stage. He pointed out that the Iraqi economy is unstable because it depends on oil by 95% and the remaining five cannot be collected now due to the lack of taxes, fees, etc noting that the move does not include international money only, but to stop deducting Kuwait's debts and Arab League dues, 
knowing that the total debt Iraq is estimated at approximately $139 billion. The International Monetary Fund had expected the Iraqi economy to shrink to a negative rate of 4.7%, while the economy of the Middle East and North Africa region would shrink by 3.3% this year against the backdrop of measures to combat the emerging coronavirus and the decline in oil prices, in the worst performance since four decades. In the World Economic Outlook, the International Monetary Fund said, the damage will be much greater than the recent financial crisis in the region in 2008 to 2009, as economic growth in Lebanon, which defaulted on its debt, is contracted by 12%, while Iraq is heading, the second largest producer in OPEC, to a negative rate of 4.7. Next article of interest. Money has no meaning anymore. By throwing trillions of dollars at the coronavirus problem, governments risk undermining trust in currencies. Doing whatever it takes to save the global economy from the coronavirus pandemic is going to cost a lot of money. The U.S. government alone is spending a few trillion dollars, and the Federal Reserve is creating another few trillion dollars to keep the financial system from collapsing. A custom Bloomberg index measuring M2 figures for 12 major economies including the U.S., China, Eurozone and Japan shows their aggregate money supply had already more than doubled to $80 trillion from before the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis. These numbers are so large that they no longer have any meaning, they are simply abstractions. It's been some time since people thought about the concept of money and its purpose. The broad idea is that money has value, but that value is not arbitrary. Former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker once said in an interview that it is a governmental responsibility to maintain the value of the currency they issue. And when they fail to do that, it is something that undermines an essential trust in government. A glut of cash. The amount of money in circulation has more than doubled since before the financial crisis in 2008 to 2009. The dollar has no real intrinsic value, backed only by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Under a fiat currency system, the government says that a dollar is a dollar. Its value relative to things such as other currencies in gold is determined on global markets. Gold is considered to be an objective store of value, and the metal's rise in dollar terms can be expressed another way, which is that the dollar fell in gold terms. That implies the market has rendered a decision on the value, or rather, the purchasing power of the dollar. The three main functions of a currency are as a unit of account, a medium of exchange and a store of value. It is that last function that is most important. Ideally, a central bank would want its currency to retain its value over time. The era of flexible monetary standards, however, allows central banks to manipulate a currency's value to help fight recessions as well as smooth out and lengthen business cycles at the expense of inflation. But even low inflation, say on the order of 2%, will greatly erode the purchasing power of the currency over time. And if there are too many dollars in circulation, the monetarists would say that the value of those dollars has diminished, eventually leading to higher prices for things. That theory hasn't worked too well in the last decade, because inflation has been low and stable, but it is too soon to declare it discredited. The transmission mechanism that results in inflation is not well understood, even 45 years after the last great period of inflation. It took a while, but it seems as though the U.S. government has decided that it has no constraints on its spending as long as the Fed continues to monetize government borrowing by purchasing the debt issued to finance expenditures. It's not crazy to think government spending may reach $10 trillion for just one year. And the numbers will go up from there. Big spenders. Budget deficits have grown and are poised to accelerate as the U.S. government spends to fight the coronavirus pandemic. Nobody really knows how this is going to turn out. In smaller economies, Runaway government spending has resulted in hyperinflation and social unrest, such as well-documented cases in Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Many think that wouldn't be possible in the U.S. given the dollar's role as the world's primary reserve currency. Perhaps, but it's not one of those questions we'd really want to experiment with. 
If all this money that's being created does spark inflation, or at least boost inflation expectations, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to reverse. Inflation rates soared in 1979, but that was during a time, unlike now, when most government officials believed that balanced budgets and careful spending were important. A blistering series of interest rate hikes pummeled inflation expectations, but the result was a hurricane force recession. Argentina, which has more or less been practicing MMD for some time, proves that it's hard to put the inflation genie back in the bottle. Argentines have been hoarding dollars, the only practical store of value, other than gold, for decades. They probably view recent events in the U.S. with some trepidation. The counterexample to all this is Japan, which historically has had the most debt relative to the size of its economy and the most radical monetary policy, and yet has a peaceful, productive society with scant inflation. Demographics explain a lot about inflation and inflation expectations, and Japan's steadily declining and aging population has put downward pressure on prices for years in spite of all the printing. Economists and central banks generally fear deflation more than inflation because it can hinder investment. History has shown that persistently high inflation rips societies apart. In deflation, people band together. Throughout Venezuela's economic crisis, we saw images of ordinary Venezuelans tossing their useless bolivars in the streets. That is what happens when money has lost all meaning. It is in jeopardy of becoming a commodity when it is supposed to be a scarce resource. There are a million reasons why the U.S. will never meet the same fate as Venezuela, but you still don't want to tamper with people's perception of the value of money. After you throw a few trillion dollars around, People start to believe that it's all a big joke. Next article of interest. A single currency system for the world. In 2019 migrants sent more than $720 billion in remittances worldwide. The average cost of sending remittances hovered close to 6%. The total cost of remittances exceeds $43 billion annually. Much of this expense is incurred toward mandatory currency conversions. Unifying the world with one common monetary unit is certainly a worthy cause. In addition to remittances it would greatly streamline trade, migration, and diplomacy. There have been several efforts in this direction. Let's take a quick account of the world's progress toward this noble goal. The case of the euro. One of the most successful examples of monetary unification is the Eurozone. Nineteen developed nations, each with a sizable economy, made a deliberate currency transition. The rewards of this progressive move are self-evident. Each Euro member state enjoys favorable trading relations with all the others. Their citizens are able to move and work freely in a vast employment market. The costs of remittances they send are close to zero. The euro has become one of the most important and strongest currencies in the world. It is the second largest traded currency after the USD. Eurozone nations support each other during crises. It is difficult to find a stronger argument than the euro for moving toward one global currency. Currency pegging. Pegging is the act of fixing the value of one currency to another's. There was a time when most of the world's currencies were pegged to gold. The gold standard served to control inflation, as well as fluctuations caused by runaway speculation. The gold standard may be history, but pegging is certainly not. Despite being members of monetary unions, some countries continue to use their indigenous currencies. They do so because they don't want to make a currency transition, or simply because they don't qualify for it yet. The currencies of Bulgaria, Denmark, and nearly 20 other counties are pegged to the euro. Another 30 currencies are directly or indirectly anchored to the USD further. Nearly 10 micro countries employ the USD as the currency of everyday use, because they don't have any of their own. Pegging gives currencies relative immunity from exchange rate fluctuations. It also brings some of the benefits of being part of monetary unions. Challenges to unification with so many good reasons to unify under a single global currency it seems counterintuitive that it has not been done yet. 
One challenge is contradictory monetary policies. National currencies are controlled by central banks, which in turn are influenced by government policies. Developing nations often have different economic objectives than developed counties. The rate of interest on long-term deposits in Bangladesh, for example, is different from that in Spain. The two countries' strategies for stimulating foreign investments are also very different. Unless all nations unify their vastly different economic objectives, it doesn't make sense for them to be part of the same monetary union. Moreover, many world regions are riddled with conflict. They don't have stable governments. Bringing them into a global monetary union would simply not make economic sense for the other member nations. A feasible solution, the context of uniting under one common currency is to address the high cost of cross-border remittances. Although a desirable goal, global currency unification is currently unviable. However, there are other ways in which remittance costs can be reduced. Part of the reason why the costs of currency conversion are high is old systems with many middlemen. In some remote parts of the world, banks enjoy near monopolistic presence. They charge exorbitant money transfer fees, sometimes as high as 12%. Better infrastructure and internet connectivity can help remedy this situation. Mobile banking is changing the face of international money transfers in unprecedented ways. Another promising fintech innovation is blockchain. The widespread use of this technology has the potential to bring remittance costs down to less than 1%. With better regulation the adoption of cryptocurrencies can widen explosively. The global monetary unit which unifies the world at some future point may well be a digital currency. Hit the like and subscribe button to be alerted as more videos are posted. Check out the Denarian blog, Facebook and Twitter as I post daily updates on those platforms throughout the day as well. The link to these and other invaluable sites are in the description box below. Knowledge is power, using that knowledge, is powerful. Over and out for now, the Denarian.